Welcome back to your legislation. And Randy Frost agreed to come in again today. Great to have you. Good to be here, Deb. Thank you. Oh, you're welcome. Now, we've got something we want everybody to know about, and that's the helmet bill for mm -hmm. the kids. Mm -hmm. How's that going to benefit the kids? Well, Deb, the helmet bill is a bill that uh, I authored and introduced in my committee early in the session. We took a lot of testimony on it, and we heard a lot from a lot of people. And probably some of your viewers have heard of it as well. Now, that bill has changed significantly, let me say, from the original bill that was introduced. Right. Uh, but the bill came to me from a, a lady by the name of Becky McNichols. And Becky's son, Scott, was injured in a terrible accident. He was actually skiing, uh, but uh, Scott hit a tree, I think around 30 miles an hour, hit it with his head, and Scott went from this vibrant young um, professional on his way to uh, a young man who now is in a wheelchair. Uh, he is nonverbal. He'll be in a, a, a long-term care yes. facility the rest of his life. And so Becky, as a mom, uh, and I'm sure the moms out there can understand this, she's heartbroken for her son. And, and so she wants to see to it as best she can that no one else gets into this situation. And so um, the helmet bill is our attempt uh, to do that. And it's going to benefit the kids because right. if kids are on a public playground or mm -hmm. public property, right. they'll have to have a helmet on. Well, uh, they don't have to. Uh, the, according to the bill, uh, we took out the portion of the bill that says you must. Oh, okay. And so what we're going to do is we're going to uh, partner with the Indiana Department of Homeland Security and the Indiana State Board of Health. And we're going to create a statewide educational program right. to reach out to parents and children uh, about the dangers of riding a, 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 a toy, or, whether yeah. it's a bicycle or a scooter or right. even a skateboard without a helmet. Um, no one goes out to uh, enjoy a day on a bicycle or a skateboard thinking they're going to have a devastating head injury, but they happen. And, and what happens once it is, is that life has changed forever. That's true. Uh, in most cases, uh, the person is no longer able to be self-sufficient. Um, the cost, both from a mental and emotional standpoint to the family, it's devastating. It's also financially devastating. These injuries are terribly expensive. And then also, uh, it's financially devastating. Uh, so, uh, these folks um, are uh, injured forever. And if we can do something about it, we should. And, and uh, you know, Deb, I spent all of my life uh, as a professional firefighter trying to make everyone's worst day a little better. And if we can prevent that worst day, that's what we should do. So the, the bill uh, does not mandate a helmet, does not, uh, there's no fine involved if you don't have a helmet. But we are going to be able to accept donations from private uh, funds to the Indiana Department of Homeland Security's Homeland Security Foundation, who will then um, purchase helmets with that money and get it back out to public safety agencies that would like to participate. And um, so that, with that it means the kids can go where and actually pick up a helmet or get a helmet? Where can they? That's right, Debbie. They can do that at a, at a local firehouse that would be participating. Could be EMS, could be your local police department. Now each one, each department will have to decide whether they want to participate or exactly. not. Exactly. But if they do, then they will receive training so that they can get the right helmet for the right child. Right. Now, these helmets aren't expensive. Uh, the testimony that we heard, $4.95 is $6 for a helmet. And um, for those of your viewers who might be saying, you know, what's the state doing uh, in this? It's, that's a legitimate question. But the answer is the state through Medicaid pays around a billion dollars a year to take care of those with these head injuries. And that's a huge amount of money from the state that could be left in the taxpayer's hands or could be used someplace else. And so uh, it's not just the right thing to do because it's an injured child or a devastated family. It's also a financial burden. It is. It, and it's a financial burden on everybody involved. It is. It is. So, well, it's good to hear that the bill kind of changed a little bit. The bill changed quite so. a bit, but I, I think our original intention is still intact. And that is that we educate as many people as possible on the need to protect themselves from these traumatic head injuries. And uh, I received a very uh, uh, kind message this week from a, a mother whose uh, son was involved in an accident just a week ago. And he was wearing a helmet and he got road rash and uh, uh, that was his most serious injury. And uh, she was very confident had he not had the hel helmet on that he would have been uh, seriously injured. Yes. Well, 
hopefully more kids will take advantage of that and mm -hmm. they'll learn what all's going on about that and decide to go get one. We certainly hope so and uh, the, the uh, program is being funded uh, with existing dollars, so there was no new appropriation to fund the, tr the educational program. That's great. Mm -hmm. Now we're going to move on to another bill that I had no idea about this one. Bill number 1045, mm -hmm. and that is Honor and Remember Flag. Mm -hmm. Now what, what is entailed in that? Uh, that is a bill that came through my committee. Um, Representative Dave Abbott introduced it. Representative Abbott's son was killed in the line of duty in the military. And the honor remember flag is a flag that can be flown in remembrance of those who gave the ultimate sacrifice. Right. And so Representative Abbott authored this bill. It was heard in my committee. Uh, I'm co-author of the bill. It passed our committee unanimously. It passed on the House floor unanimously. And uh, what it does is it says that during the month of May, the honor and remember flag will be flown at any state uh, uh, agency, whether it be the state house or state buildings or state cemeteries. It could be flown and should be actually at others like City Hall and so on. That's not a mandate, but the state is. And understand too, Debbie, that this is a bill that just passed the House. Right. It still has to go through the Senate yes. and it still has to get the governor's signature. I doubt whether we have any trouble. This is a really good bill, but uh, this this want everyone to know that uh, it's not um, it's not a law yet. But it is, it's, a, it's a flag, and, you, and people can order these flags. You can. And fly and, uh, on themselves like, during the month of May. That's right. I mean, it's a beautiful flag, and uh, the description that Representative Abbott gave of the different colors, different signs and symbols on the flag um, are very, very touching, especially from a father who lost his son in the military. The next time you come in, we'll try to have a, an image of that flag so okay. we can explain the colors and why it's arranged the way it is. That'd be great, and uh, I look forward to actually going to the bill signing with Representative Abbott in the governor's office when that becomes law. Maybe we could cover that as well, and uh, folks could, could see the flag then. That'd be good. That's awesome. That would yeah, be We'll good. invite you to come up and record that in the governor's office. <laughs> okay. We'll try to make it. We'll make it happen. So now we're going to move on to House Bill 1198. Yep. And this is, I used to be a dispatcher, so I'm really excited about this one. Dispatchers are going to have a new category that they fall mm. under, which will benefit them greatly. Well, um, I think we need to clarify. Uh, it's Dispatchers are going to be recognized as first responders. Now, as such, it doesn't change their pay. It doesn't even change their uh, classification within the city or the county where they work. What it does is it gives them the recognition that they believe and we believe they should have had all along. They are a part of our first responders. They're the first one on the scene. Now, they're not there physically, but they are there. And they're talking to the person. Mm -hmm. They're talking uh, to them to give them uh, help on what to do, uh, talking to them about the response and who's coming and that they'll be there and when. So uh, very important to our dispatchers. And I'm also a co-author of that bill and um, really proud of that bill as well. Well, that is really neat because it, when they're on the phone, they're actually talking people through a process mm -hmm. of saving somebody's life or their own. Absolutely, Debbie. And we heard testimony committee that uh, one dispatcher, and I'm sure many dispatchers have done this, has talked somebody out of committing suicide. Right. Um, so they saved a life. They might not have been a hold of that person or be able to touch them right. physically, but they touched them. They did. And so uh, they, they deserve it. And I'm just happy as I could be that that came through my committee. It passed unanimously as well. And then uh, it's on its way to the Senate, uh, passed unanimously on the House floor, too. So uh, I'm sure they will greatly appreciate it. Well, they deserve it. It's, it's an honor for us to honor them. That's, that's right. Now, the next bill we have to talk about is House Bill 1346. And that is to do with the jail overcrowding. Right, so right. what has happened with that bill so far? Well, as, uh, as always happens, Debbie, bills get amended, and most of the time they get better. Uh, sometimes they're amended because maybe they cost too much money or it just needs to be fixed. In this case, we refined the bill quite a bit. And last year, with a, a bill that became law, it was House Enrolled Act 1065, we created the Jail Overcrowding Task Force. Now, it met around the state last summer, and uh, the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court was the chair, and many members, Sheriff's Association, prosecutors, public defenders, county commissioners, others, were on that commission. And they came back with a report, and the report uh, basically outlined that we've got a lot of work to do if we want to solve our jail overcrowding problems. The biggest thing that I took away from it is what might be necessary to help Jefferson County or Jennings County or Switzerland County 
may not work at all in another county. And what works well there may not work here. Uh, each county uh, is, is doing their own thing and some of them do very well. So um, what we're going to do is we're going to roll the responsibilities of the Jail Overcrowding Task Force into a, a, a group called uh, JRAC. And JRAC's job is, uh, among other things, to do what we're doing with Jail Overcrowding Task Force. So we're going to uh, continue our work with them to continue looking at why jails are overcrowded and come up with potential solutions. Um, we know that one year study is not near enough. Right. We got a lot more information to, to get a hold of. The other thing the bill does is there's currently a database that's being created through a grant by the Sheriff's Association to uh, notify victims of what's happening with the person that perpetrated the crime on them. Uh, but that database is also a available to collect additional data. For instance, who's in a jail, why you're there, how long you've been there, um, uh, what the, the disposition of your case is. And so we're going to collect that data as well. And my bill says all, all 92 counties, all counties will have to participate. So what we found out was this year with our task force was we don't really have good data. We don't really know exactly what's going on per county. Uh, the counties know, but from county to county to county, do we know? And You've we lost don't. that connection between all of them. And what we want to do is take an, a 10,000 foot look and go, well, this is doing well over here. This is not doing so well over here. We need to uh, uh, direct Implement. resources right. and, and concentrate on this area in this way. We also know that we have to do better with uh, mental health treatment. Uh, we have to do better, and we have to do better with drug treatment. Uh, so we learned a lot. Um, the bill this year uh, does not solve all these problems. It's just too big. It's going to take years for us to work through it. And, and part yeah. of that is you want to be able to have one county be able to access a database and know what's happened in a county a hundred miles away. Mm. The idea is for all the counties to be connected. Yes. And then uh, the primary reason is for the victims to be notified of what's happening. But the other is to collect this data. Um, we know we need it and uh, it was currently voluntary before our bill and now it'll be mandated. That'll be great because the more those officers can do and the more the victims can actually have access to, it would be greatly beneficial to all of them. So. I, think, I think it's just going to be one more piece in the puzzle mm -hmm. to help solve this very complex problem. Yeah. Now, with all these bills that have been mm -hmm. going through the House and the Senate, now that that's all happened, what what is the next step? Yeah, that's a great question. <laughs> what, is, what is going to so, happen with those bills now? So the first half of session uh, concluded last week. And uh, the only place that I know of where two halves don't make a whole is the General Assembly. And the second half is where Senate bills that pass the Senate come to the House. House bills that pass the House go to the Senate. And it starts all over again. Yes. All the bills have to go through committee. After committee, if they pass, they come to the Senate House or House floor where they're heard, uh, voted on, and whether they pass or they don't pass. If they've been amended at the end of session, after the second half, remember I said two halves don't make a whole. That's right. The end of the second half is called conference committee. And conference committee is where we work out the differences between the version that passed the House and the Senate. The House can say we like what the Senate did, and the House voted on it again, and it goes to the governor. We can say we don't like what they did, take it out, put it back to the House version, Senate has to vote on it again. Or we can come to a compromise and both chambers have to vote on it. Remember, no bill can go to the governor for his signature that hasn't passed both oh. the House and the Senate in identical form. <clears throat> so the last two weeks is called Conference Committee, and that's what we'll be working on there uh, after the second half uh, to reconcile those bills. You got a lot going on. We've got about six <laughs> weeks left, short session, but you, kn you wouldn't know it. A lot, a lot of legislation moving yet. Well, that, that's just, it's easy to have that happen because then there may be more ideas that come out of trying to get that bill through. Mm -hmm. Somebody might add something that oh, makes absolutely. it better. Absolutely. So. Once a bill uh, goes to the other chamber, it's often that someone over there will see something that made that bill better we didn't think about. And that's really uh, the process is that you need both bodies looking at it subjectively. And uh, so 
many times a bill will get amended, but it makes it better. Yeah. And uh, very rarely do you disagree with an amendment. Uh, so we'll see. Uh, our colleagues in the Senate do a great job, and uh, we always like working with them. And we'll see what they have to say, and then we'll put some things in some of their bills, I'm sure, see what they think of that, and work it out at the end. That's great. Yeah. At least y'all are willing to work together. That's good. That's well, we work together quite well. Um, a high percentage, over 80% of our bills are uh, with less than 10 no votes. So right. massive uh, bipartisan support, and uh, as it should be. You know, uh, We work together. Um, we, we do our work, and then we go home and live under the laws we pass. That's great. Now, if people want to get in contact with you guys about a bill that they've mm -hmm. seen online, mm -hmm. and they're wanting to give in some positive input, mm -hmm. sure. can they just send an email? They can. They, uh, they can go to the Indiana General Assembly web page mm -hmm. and then click on your legislator, and you can contact your legislator that way. Uh, you can find me on Facebook. I'm on Facebook. You can send me a message there. or uh, And I'm sure most legislators are that way. Um, but we'd love to hear from our folks, and so give us a call at the State House or send us an email, um, or you can come and testify in committee. Everyone is welcome to come to the State House. It's your State House. You can come and testify on a bill in committee if you'd like. Um, in my committee, I've never been in a committee where someone was denied the opportunity to speak. Oh, wow. That's, yeah. that's good to know. S some committee hearings go long because there are a lot of people who want, want to be heard, but that's the way it's supposed to work. Yes. Well, it's good to know you all try to make sure it happens when we it do. should. Now, is there anything else we need to let people know before we before we let you go? Nope. About, oh, good. We covered everything, didn't we? <laughs> <laughs> awesome. That's great. <laughs> well, we really appreciate our sponsors, and we're very thankful Randy came by to do this. This uh, is great. I enjoy doing it, Debbie. Thanks for having me. Well, we appreciate it because the more information we have about the process, mm -hmm. the better the better we can have input on what's going on in a, in a positive way. Mm. And that and that's another thing. You know, if you don't agree with something and you go to call or email, call with a solution. And Sounds like my grandfather. It, yes. I, <laughs> you know, I, to me, I don't think, I don't complain unless I have a solution because there's no need in it because if you don't have a solution, it's not going to go anywhere. <laughs> so you got to have something. So try to make a, a positive impact on these guys when they're trying to make a decision. So. And as always, we appreciate our sponsors, and we appreciate you watching.